Welcome, everyone. Thank you for making your way all the way to the far side of the hall over here. Um, my name is Jeffrey Cohen. I know we're getting started a little bit late. Uh, I'll do my best to still end uh, about 1130. Um, so it may be that for questions, um, if I'm right up against the clock, um, I'll hang out here for as long as you guys want uh, to take questions afterwards. It might be a little bit easier than uh, trying to extend the time of the, the session so we can all get to lunch. Uh, welcome to RailsConf. I think this is my fifth RailsConf. Um, for those of you, this is your first time, welcome. Uh, and I hope that this conference is really meaningful for you as it's been for me over the years. Um, I've been uh, working with Rails since uh, the beginning, about 2006. I currently consult on projects that <clears throat> come under some kind of regulation. So HIPAA, PCI, um, and I also work with companies on building mentorship and apprenticeship programs. One of the common topics that has come up in both of those um, endeavors has been questions about cryptography. And uh, it was also very new to me. I'm not a mathematics kind of person. I got into programming uh, without a computer science degree and uh, realized that I also was interested in kind of learning the basics. So this is a, totally a beginner level talk. I'm just gonna tell you a story about my path to how I started to unlock in my mind how the most uh, common uses of um, cryptography crop up in everyday programming, especially in, in Ruby programming. So. That's what this is, and if you feel five minutes in that this is not for you, then that's totally cool. You should, there's a lot of other great sessions too, but <laughs> hopefully this will be helpful. Um, so I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna end up talking about how public key cryptography works, but without the mathematics. For those of you interested in some of the gory details on the math, happy to talk about that uh, immediately afterwards. But I'm gonna try to keep the math somewhat um, light for the talk. In 1586, Mary, Queen of Scots, was found to be plotting against Queen Elizabeth. She was sending enciphered messages to her co-conspirators. The messages were intercepted and she did not live much longer. Um, this is a sort of a cheat sheet of the uh, from the folks who that were, were working out that cipher that was discovered. And uh, so for a very long time, <laughs> the idea of keeping things secret has been of paramount importance to governments and to individuals. Um, and for a long time, it kind of stayed the same. You basically tried to make up some secret way to communicate and hope that it wouldn't be figured out. And things pretty much stayed the same way for thousands of years until encryption became mechanized. So a lot of you probably recognize this machine. This is the Enigma machine, probably the most famous example of cryptographic machinery, eventually broken by a famous British mathematician who happened to invent the notion of a general purpose computer along the way. Do you guys know who I'm talking about? Exactly, this guy, right? <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, today we, we depend on cryptography for everything. Um, you know, recently we all got these credit cards with the little chip in it. It's like, wait a minute, how does that chip work? Well, why is that actually better than the magnetic stripe that we've been using? The rules of cryptography and the advancements in computerizing cryptography is what's now enabling our modern society. It's hard to start to think about what would happen if we didn't have these abilities. So let me go back a little bit. 
to the history of what we're really talking about here. Uh, so formally, we think about it in this way. By the way, this chart and um, a few other slides, I want to credit a book by Simon Singh. If you're interested in this topic at all, uh, there's a book called The Code Book, 1999, that uh, is fantastic and taught me a lot about what I'm going to be talking about today. But uh, ciphers, which is what we use right now, letter by letter encoding, is only a very specific branch of cryptography. And that's, so I'll be focusing on the cipher part of cryptography because that's almost, uh, that is what we use every day. Uh, I also want to say up front, cryptography is not the same as security. <laughs> you can be very good at encrypting and decrypting your data um, and yet not be secure. Security is a whole other umbrella topic. There are some other great talks uh, in this conference about security. Um, I'm just focusing on that very small piece of it, which is cryptography. And there are two primary use cases um, for cryptography, verification and secrecy. This verification piece is what surprised me. <laughs> I just thought it was for secrecy. But actually, the verification is important too. So let me start with that one. Um, and there are actually two subcases for verification, um, message tampering and authorship. So let, let me start with message tampering. And this is basically asking the question, how can we verify that a message was transmitted and it didn't change along the way? Now, sometimes we hear the word tampering and we think someone's intentionally messing with the data. But that's not uh, the entire situation. Uh, those of us who started programming back when there were dial-up modems had to worry about just the bits getting mixed up along the way as they came down the phone line. Uh, so just a quick history lesson here. There, there was a thing called parity bits. We still use this in some cases here. So if, if let me just take the number one internet use today, which is looking for cats, apparently. If I were to Google for the word cat, we all know that in ASCII, we translate into that into binary. I'm sure you could all come up with the ones and zeros that represent that word. So imagine the, the letters cat are trying to come down the wire to you. How do you know that you're actually receiving the message that was intended? Maybe they meant to send the word bat or rat, and yet you got cat. How do you know that that's correct? And so an early system was, well, was, hey, you know, one way we could verify is something called parity. And so here's an example of even parity. That what you do is in each byte, you make sure that the number of ones in that byte, that there's an even number of ones in that byte. So in the first byte there, you can see there would normally be three. We use that leftmost bit the most significant bit, and we'll flip that as needed so that the number of bits in that byte, there's always an even number. Now, you had to pre-agree with whoever's sending the data whether they were using even or odd parity. So if they were using odd, then it would look kind of like that. And so this was one way to verify that the data that you, that you downloaded or that you're getting matched but of course, you can easily see this doesn't really handle all of the cases. There are other letters where you would have an even number of bits in the byte, and you would think that, it, that it's correct even though it's not. So it wasn't perfect, but it was, a, it was an attempt to think about how can we verify that the data coming is the data that was intended. And that struggle uh, remains true. For me, in my story, in my path to how to understand other ideas of cryptography, it actually started with the notion of check digits. <laughs> in the late 60s, cash registers looked like this. And you would be buying your apples and they would ring it up manually. Eventually the store owner said, you know, sometimes we're making, we are making mistakes when we enter the price. Also, there's no good way to keep track of the inventory just by entering the price. Let's have you enter a product code instead. So we'll enter product code one, two, three for apples. 
problem was it was easy to make a mistake and enter one, two, four. So they said, ah, I know what we'll do. We'll add another digit to somehow verify that the first three digits were correct. Now, that's kind of a weird idea, but you might imagine, okay, what if we just add up the first three digits? So if the product code is one, two, three, we'll make that six. So the real product code will be one, two, three, six. Great. So now if I type in one, two, four, it's caught. Um, but if I type in three, two, one, it's not caught. So you actually have to think about doing more than just summing up the numbers. And you end up with today's craziness, a maniacal formula for doing UPC codes. There's a check digit at the very end, and I've listed the algorithm there, but basically you go through a, you do some mathematics, you take a remainder, you might have to even manipulate the remainder number, and that's your check digit. So during the conference today, you can pick up any Coke can or anything that's got a barcode on it, and it probably will follow this algorithm. Uh, and in fact, there are a lot of words now that actually just mean check digit. This was my aha moment. <laughs> when we're talking about hashes or digests or fingerprints, they're just checksums against some body of content. So you can take some body of content, whether it's a barcode or an entire novel, and create a check digit that's unique to that particular content. One that Rails developers are probably familiar with is Bcrypt. So here's the password that I use on all of my banking sites, just for an example. Um, and you'll get some Bcrypt hash. And I've wondered, always wondered, like, what is it doing? Like, how in the world did it come up with that? But the main thing to know is that reversing that is impossible. That's why we use a one-way hash. If I showed you that barcode and I gave you the check digit, and I said, now tell me the other 11 digits in the barcode, you'd be like, oh man, that's not fair, <laughs> right? So the same thing with the bcrypt. I give you that, I say, okay, now what was the password? You're like, I don't know, that's impossible. And that's the whole idea of using a hash. So for security, where you, you just need to check that some incoming content is correct, but you don't know what that content was, that's where, where a one-way hash is helpful. Let's talk about symmetric encryption. Suppose I have a simple message I want to send to you. I think of some super elaborate scheme in which I encode it so that my friends can't decode it, like I'm just going to advance all the letters by one. This is the so-called Caesar cipher. It's been around for, well, as you can tell, a very long time. Um, that algorithm that we use to do the encryption, advanced by one, the, the fancy word for that is a key. All right, so in this case, I just have a key. It happens to be advanced by one. And the good thing in this case is that it's reversible so that whoever I'm sending my message to can figure out what I was originally intending. Um, and so you may have heard of some, algorith some algorithms such as DES or triple DES or AES-128 or 256. Blowfish, there, there's a whole gamut. Wikipedia is your friend if you really want to know all about <coughs> symmetric encryption. And often we need to use symmetric encryption. We need to be able to, to decrypt things. Of course, do not use symmetric encryption for passwords, right? Because you might think, well, I need to know what the password is so that when they log in, I can verify that what they've typed in is correct. That's actually, uh, a bad idea because if you're, you're ever th accused of letting your passwords be stolen, you can say, no, no, it's okay. I've done the symmetric encryption. And the police would say, oh, who can decrypt it? And you could say, don't worry, only me. And you're in big trouble. So you don't want to be in that. In the, that you want to use the one-way hash for, for passwords. But for cases where you do want to be able to decrypt, which is very often you want to use symmetric encryption. Uh, but there's a problem, which uh, Mary Queen of Scots faced, which was, how do I transmit the key? How do I let the receiver know what my algorithm is? Otherwise, they won't know how to decrypt it. This was the case for literally thousands of years until the early 70s, when some mathematical breakthroughs really did the impossible. And our modern society is now 
based on what we call public key cryptography. And the idea here is we're going to use two keys, and each key transforms data. But the special thing is that we call them a pair because sort of mathematically, they can reverse the effect of the other. Um, so another aha moment for me was that with these two keys, one key is arbitrarily selected to be the public key, and you simply keep the other one as the private key. I always thought there was some magical thing. You run SSH key gen, like GitHub tells you to, and okay, it gave me a private key and a public key. I guess there was some real reason behind that. That's pretty much an arbitrary distinction. <laughs> but I'll show you in a minute here. So when you have two keys, and I want to encrypt something, I pick a key, and it will transform into something almost impossible to decipher. In fact, I know that the only way to decipher it is with the other key of that pair. If, if I don't have the other key of that pair, I know that this is gonna be unbreakable until quantum computing, which we'll save for the end of the course, uh, uh, end, end of, the, of, of the talk. Once I've encrypted it, I can decrypt it by simply selecting the other key. Both of them transform data. They just so happen to exactly undo the effects of the other. But it doesn't matter which one you start with. It doesn't matter which one you call public and private. That's an arbitrary decision. So here's an example. Two friends, one's out hiking, the other's jogging. They want to meet up for lunch. So Mr. A wants to send a, a message to Mr. B using that brand new, cool smartwatch. While he's hiking, he can just tap in a couple things, and somehow everything gets encrypted and sent over. Hey, I'll meet you at noon for lunch. Your friend, Mr. A. So here's how we would use those two keys to do this securely. So the first thing is, and this is the step that I always missed, and I didn't understand what was going on until I figured out this step. If Mr. A wants to send a message to Mr. B secretly, Mr. A uses Mr. B's public key. I always thought Mr. A had to use Mr. A's keys or something, right? The keys that I've generated I should use to encrypt. It's not true. <laughs> I use Mr. B's public key. So Mr. B is going to receive some encrypted message. Who can decrypt that? Right? Well, hopefully by now it's pretty obvious um, that Mr. B can decrypt the message with Mr. B's private key. Right? So Mr. B's pair are mathematically linked, and they exactly undo the effect of the other. So if I want Mr. B to be able to decrypt I need to use Mr. B's public key to encrypt. And that's why one is public and one is private. By the way, I've also gotten questions sometimes like, how do I guard the public key? And you don't. Okay, it's, a, it's public for a reason. It's okay, everybody has it, that's all right. So in this case, right, Mr. A needs that public key. And, uh, and that's how we can securely send messages um, without pre-deciding on an algorithm, without having to beforehand transmit some key. Okay, next use case is authenticity. So, a long time ago, the way that we knew that the orders to the army at the front came from the king was there was physically a wax seal that would go on the scroll of the paper. <laughs> but this wasn't just decorative. Right? That design of that seal was unique. So the king of England, say, or the queen of England had a very unique seal that could be recognized. Reproducing that was nearly impossible. 
And it was only in one place, right, which is on the ring, which in theory was on the hand of the queen or the king. So if you received something that you could verify had not been opened and had that particular design, you knew it had to come from that hand. That's how we would verify that something was authentic. Right? It's one thing to receive a message, hey, meet me at noon for lunch, signed Mr. A, but maybe it's not really Mr. A. Maybe it's Mr. Z. You know? So um, knowing not only what the message says, but to verify that it came from who we said it came from is super important. If I go to Amazon.com to buy some books, but I'm not really at Amazon.com, I'm giving my money to someone else. How do I know? Right? I, like, how do I know when I go to Google.com that's really Google? There are all sorts of DNS and networking tricks that I, I don't, I'm, I'm not a networking expert that I know could be played upon me <laughs> that could present a page that could make it look like it's one of those other sites, even with that domain name. So how do we know? Most of our friends and family may not realize you can click that lock in the browser and you'll get what they call a certificate. And that's supposed to prove the authenticity of the publisher of that site. And uh, uh, in fact, you can click through and actually see the cryptographic hash that's in there. And the way that that works is, is almost exactly what I'm about to describe here. The same way that Mr. A and Mr. B can verify that Mr. A was actually the author goes something like this. After receiving that same message from Mr. A, sorry, be before Mr. A sends that message out, Mr. A is also going to calculate a digest of that content, okay? So using something like MD5 or, or one of the SHA, uh, SHA-128, SHA-256, or SHA-1, SHA-2 family of digests like we use for Git, whatever you want to use is pretty good. And, and you calculate that digest. Instead of a single digit like we had with the UPC code, it'll be maybe 16 characters or 32 characters. It's a fixed length digest, a sort of check digit, regardless of how large your original content was. So you calculate your digest using one of these hashing algorithms, and you then encrypt that digest number with your private key. Okay, this is, act, this is the equivalent of the wax seal. You're taking something that's private, it's that ring that's on your finger, nobody else has, and we've taken the, the digest, that is the check digit, to, the thing that we use to know that the original content has not been tampered with, we're going to encrypt just the digest with the private key, okay? Everything else has been encrypted with Mr. B's public key, but the digest we encrypt differently. So sometimes we, they'll call this a digital fingerprint, um, or sometimes it's called part of the certificate. Um, it's really just a hash that's been encrypted with the private key. Okay, so now Mr. B receives the message as well as the digest that's been encrypted. The, di the, the message part we already talked about. That can be decrypted with Mr. B's private key, but how do you verify that the wax seal that's coming to you is from the person that you think it is. Again, actually pretty straightforward. Mr. B can decrypt that using Mr. A's public key, right? Because Mr. A used their private key to encrypt the digest. Why would we do that? Because the public key, which is available to everyone, can decrypt that wax seal so everyone can verify who it came from. Okay, so then, having decrypted that hash, Mr. B independently calculates the hash of the content that was received. So you decrypt that content, you, generate, you calculate your own hash, and you now compare the hash that you came up with with the hash that was transmitted and signed and sealed 
by the original sender. And if they match, then an amazing thing has happened. <laughs> you have received a secret message and you've verified who it came from, uh, all in a way that no one else would be able to ever decipher or break. Okay, so for both authenticity and for secrecy, it turns out that public key cryptography solves amazingly all of the encryption cryptography problems that we had for really thousands of years. Like we are living in a weird time right now <laughs> where we can now uh, electronically perform this kind of computation. Okay, so before public key cryptography, you know, if you need to move money between banks, for example, I want to send money from Chicago to New York, they, need, they did that uh, over electronic lines, but they had to, the banks in Chicago and New York had to each know what the encryption and decryption scheme was. So it had to previously be in some secret conveyance of that into the banks before that could, could work. And as you can tell, this doesn't really scale. <laughs> Just by having to mail out or deliver the secret codes to all of the banks all over the world and change them on a rotating basis, almost impossible. It was really not until the 70s when the RSA algorithms and the whole idea of public key cryptography took hold that then everything was allowed to explode in terms of computerization and letting computation take the place of cryptography. So far, so good? Okay, I'm almost about to wrap up, so I'm, we're doing good on time. Okay, now, but just a, just a minute. So those of you who might have actually been paying attention to my craziness here, this is the line that GitHub, I looked on the help page for, from GitHub, it says here's how you should generate your SSH keys. And this basically says I'm gonna generate two keys using the RSA algorithm with a bit length of 4,096 4, bits. So you may have heard this term, bit length, how many bits are you supposed to use when you're generating these things? This number has changed in recommendation from time to time. Sometimes it's been 512, 10, that was 1024, then 2048, now they're saying 4096. Who knows if this will ever stop? What is, what is this really referring to? Why does this number matter? The way I think of it is that when you're encrypting something, let's say the text of a book or an email message, what first happens is we take that message, think of it in its binary form, just like I showed in the slides earlier, and then you're gonna take, say every 10, 12 bits at a time and scramble them and then move on to the next section of 10 or 12 bits and then scramble those. This is a very common way of, of encrypting data called a block cipher because you take blocks of data at a time. The RSA doesn't work like that. The RSA has to take your entire message as one block and encrypt it. So if I have, if I were to specify a bit length here of um, 16, I would only be able to encrypt a two byte message. <laughs> Not so useful. Instead, you know, 4096 gives you a lot more characters to play with, but it's still pretty limited. So for, for practical use, right, if I wanted to take a really big book and, and encrypt it and send it to someone. I couldn't use, for example, my private key or my public key to encrypt that. It's just way much bigger than 4,000 4, bits would, would give me to work with. So this doesn't really work. <laughs> RSA can actually only encrypt messages that are short. The key length here, by the way, is, is actually not the length of your RSA key. If you were to open up the public and private key files that you get, from when you run the SSH key gen. They are just text files, by the way. You can just open them up uh, and they are readable. Um, you'll find that the length of those messages is not 4,096 bits. And again, this is where I was like, what in the world is going on? It turns out that what they call the key length is actually the length of a mathematical number called the modulus 
that's going to get generated and plugged into this gigantic mathematical formula. That's really what this length is, 4096. Because of the math involved, there's exponents and there's some, some modulus arithmetic, increasing the bit length by only a little bit actually gives you an amazing amount of power. So uh, anyway, the thing with the RSA is that it's not actually encrypting all of your content itself. Asymmetric algorithms like RSA are also much slower than symmetric. So what do we do? Do, do we go back to using symmetric encryption for large things and use only RSA for short things? Yes, actually that's what we do. So modern cryptography, we use both. What'll happen is we will use a public key cryptography to just encrypt a very short number or key. So what will usually happen is we would generate some random hash and use RSA to encrypt that. And use that as the basis for all subsequent symmetric cryptography. This is how SSL or TLS works. When you first connect to Amazon.com, there's a quick exchange between your computer and Amazon's computer of a randomly generated symmetric key. But in order to transmit that symmetric key without someone being able to be in the middle and eavesdrop on that and then be able to decrypt everything, that symmetric key is transmitted via public key cryptography. All right, so once we've securely transmitted the symmetric key, now that symmetric key can be used for the duration of that transmission. So your whole session on Amazon with that, with that lock is, that, um, is gonna be encrypted differently than your next session with Amazon. And that's what we want. We wanna keep rotating um, the cryptographic hash. All right. So currently we use uh, public key cryptography. There's a whole set of standards. There's a lot of different algorithms. RSA isn't the only one. It is still the most popular but we're already seeing adoption of some completely different algorithms. Uh, you may have heard of elliptic curve. Um, this gets into mathematics that are over my head, but um, some elliptic curve algorithms have now been approved as part of the whole public key uh, standard. And uh, this is just an attempt to keep ahead of the bad people, right? This whole thing is just an arms race. And there's a looming issue coming with all of this called quantum computing. So Microsoft has a great um, podcast on their, uh, on res their Microsoft research regarding security. And they've been talking about quantum cr cryptography and uh, quantum computing. You may have heard that quantum computing is going to revolutionize all of the sort of classical computers that we currently use by taking advantage of quantum physics. And the problem that this poses for public key cryptography is that um, we, all of this public private key business is hinged on the idea in mathematics that if you have a super large number, it's very hard to figure out the factors of that number, right? So if I, if I gave you a number like 12, you could figure out, okay, the factors are two and three, the, the, the prime factors. But if I gave you a number like a million and nine, it would take you some time. There's no other way other than brute force for a computer to figure out what the prime factors of a number are. But under quantum computing, that task might be solved and suddenly public key cryptography could be broken very quickly. So, it turns out that there are some, some implications coming within the next 10 years, maybe 20 years, on what this means on the state of cryptography. Some experts are saying that it's actually not to worry. <laughs> One of the downsides of quantum computing is that symmetric encryption actually becomes difficult to break, of all things. So we may have to adjust the way that we do the encryption, but all is not lost. 
Others are saying that fears about quantum computing are unfounded any time in the foreseeable future. And by the time we do have a solution, uh, we will also have figured out what kind of quantum computers cannot do very well, and that will be a good hint as to how we should encrypt and decrypt secret things. And that's all I know about cryptography. <laughs> um, so I only have a couple minutes left, so um, if you do have any questions, I'm gonna hang out here. Um, any question at all, any question at all, I would love to talk about it. Or um, if you wanna remain more anonymous, if you wanna ask me over Twitter or DM me over Twitter, that's totally fine. If you wanna be super private, you can always email me. Um, I'm an adjunct at the University of Chicago and uh, would love to talk about um, cryptography with you uh, anytime. Thank you very much.